So, in the last couple of modules we have learned how to record steady state absorption and emission spectra, but then uh, let us not forget that the purpose of this course is to learn how to make time resolved measurements, how to measure the rate constant of ultra fast processes. So, that is the direction in which we will proceed after this, but to do that it is important that we record steady state spectra first. Without that it makes no sense uh, starting to do the time resolved experiment right away because you do not really know then uh, what kind of uh, sample you are handling, what the energetics are and so on and so forth. So, just to uh, recollect what we have learned so far, the correct sequence of doing experiments is that you must record an absorption spectrum first followed by emission spectrum and then you must record an excitation spectrum and uh, you are happy if the excitation spectrum exactly matches a normalized absorption spectrum. If it does not then either you have something interesting going on there is ground state heterogeneity or you have some impurity in the sample. Most of the time unfortunately the second case is correct. So, one needs to be careful even when we do seemingly mundane steady state experiments. Okay. That being uh, said let us come back to the question we had asked in one of the earlier modules. We want to follow fast processes and we know uh, what how fast fast processes are in chemistry. The fastest process we have learned is expected to take about 170 femtosecond and we had shown you some data from Professor Ahmed Zuel's work where they had actually taken snapshots of a bond breaking. But now suppose we want to do an experiment like that, suppose we want to follow a really fast process, how do we do it? That is what we are going to discuss today, how to follow fast processes. And uh, what we will do now is we will restrict our discussion mainly to electronic levels, but it is not very difficult to incorporate vibrational levels into this or to go over to uh, completely vibrational levels altogether, right. That is what we discussed how to follow fast processes. And this is uh, something that we had shown earlier from Zewell's Nobel lecture of 1999, arrow of time. We had said that the capability of following ultra fast processes or fast processes has increased tremendously over the last few decades. As you see in 1960s one could uh, actually measure nanosecond in 1953. 1950s one could measure microsecond, but 1960s onwards the journey towards picosecond and femtosecond and subsequently attosecond has been quite rapid. So, it is not very difficult anymore to uh, measure processes that are uh, in femtosecond time regime. So, we will start with uh, that kind of an example. So, the first thing you need is you want to initiate a process by a pulsed excitation. We have discussed briefly what a pulse is. A pulse is light that goes on for a short duration and then goes off again. And here we typically work with femtosecond to picosecond maximum nanosecond uh, pulses. And when I say femtosecond pulses, I mean full width at half maximum is of the order of femtosecond. So, let us say I take a source of pulsed radiation and we excite whatever molecules we have using pulse excitation. How does the pulse uh, what does the pulse look like? Like this. If x axis is time, then the ideal pulse would be a delta function. What is a delta function? Yeah. Yeah. So, it means that it has uh, some a delta function has a finite value only at one value of time or one value of x and for all other values it is equal to 0. Okay. And of course, right now we are performing an idealized discussion. It is uh, actually not possible to get a pulse that has absolutely 0 width, all that is relative. But for now, let us say that we have a capability of having a pulse which is a delta function and you excite your sample with it. Now, let us think of what happens to excited state population. Before the pulse comes, is it possible to have any excited state population? No, right. What happens when the pulse comes? All of a sudden, this is the pulse, right. Let us say these are the two energy levels in the system. 
the pulse has come and we are going to call it a pump pulse because what the pulse does is that it, it takes the system from this energy level to that energy level right. So, that is a pump pulse. Now, what happens at the instant the pulse is on? At that instant some molecules depending on how strong the pulse is some finite number of molecules would get promoted to their excited state or in other words at that instant excited state population is created and then the light goes off. What happens when the light goes off? Do all the molecules in the excited state come back to the ground state at that instant? Do you think uh, that would happen? That would not happen. So, what happens rather is that the excited state population decays over time. This is uh, sort of like nuclear decay. You know that uh, radioactive nuclei decay uh, to more stable nuclei as uh, and it is a first order process. Now, they are left to decay by themselves. It is a first order process by which they decay. Here also what we have done essentially is that we have created an excited state population and we have left the molecules there to decay by themselves. So, this decay in the simplest case scenario is going to be a first order or exponential decay. The question is how do I follow it and how do I follow it with femtosecond time resolution. Do not forget our purpose is to study things in femtosecond time scale. To do this what we do is let us consider this is your sample this square right here. Let us consider this is the pulse pump light. We need a second pulse to follow the time evolution of the excited state. That pulse is called a probe pulse and the pulse let us say for now is such that its energy exactly matches an absorption of the excited state that is created by the pump pulse all right. And what we do is we uh, detect the intensity not of the pump light, but rather the uh, probe light ok. Let us say I have a detector here not here, here then I will be uh, following the intensity of the uh, light that passes through the probe light that passes through the sample right. And uh, what we have learned in steady state absorption spectroscopy is that when we look at intensity like this it makes sense to talk in terms of absorbance epsilon C L. And the advantage of working with absorbance is that of course, it is uh, proportional to concentration. So, now see this red light the probe light is absorbed by the excited state and not by the ground state. So, if I work out absorbance of the probe light then I get to know the concentration of the excited state is not it right. So, whatever absorbance value I get at time 0 that should be able to give me a measure of the concentration of the excited state produced as a result of instantaneous excitation ok. Now, let us say I delay the, the pulse probe light with respect to the pulse pump light and that can be done very easily. Let us say we have a uh, pump source and we have a probe source. Of course, light uh, we have to reflect light using optics right and mostly in femtosecond time regime we do not want to use lenses we as far as possible we want to use mirrors. Let us say and we are going to go, go to the lab and see it for ourselves. Let us say that we have given some kind of a path difference to the pump or to the probe and let us say the path differences are exactly the same to start with. The pump and the probe lights appear at the sample exactly at the same time. Then what will happen? The probe light is going to interrogate this situation that kind that time at which the path difference between pump and probe is 0 is called time 0 ok. So, that is what the probe light is going to interrogate it is going to uh, tell us what is the population of the excited state at the instant of excitation. What happens if I change the path length a little bit? Suppose the path length to start with is such that the probe has reached the sample before the pulse. Then of course, there is no excited state population and absorbance for the probe light is 0 and that is the situation at this point in time and this point in time. Then when time 0 is achieved then all of a sudden we see a strong absorbance because at that instant the excited state population has been created. 
Now, if I keep on changing the uh, path length of the probe light. Now, suppose the probe light reaches the sample after the pump light say at this instant. What will happen? By that time the excited state population would have decreased from here to here right. So, in this expression C would have gone down and uh, correspondingly absorbance would have also gone down. So, what I get here is that I get a decreased value of absorbance of probe light remember we get a decrease in the absorbance of probe light that is proportional to the decrease in the excited state population in that time. So, if I keep on changing uh, the delay of the probe light then it is going to come later and later and later compared to the pump light and it is going to interrogate lesser and lesser and lesser population of the excited state correspondingly absorbance will go down and now the plot that you get what is shown as these big circles in uh, this diagram the plot that you get is exactly of the same shape as the plot of decay of excited state population with time after excitation by pulse light. Are we clear? Okay. So, this is how one can uh, follow the dynamics in time by giving a path length. Now, let us do a, a quick little bit of math. What kind of path length do I have to give uh, in order to get say 1 frame per second time resolution? So, to do that it is useful to remember something that is very easy light travels 1 foot in 1 nanosecond and when I say 1 foot I mean 30 centimeter right that comes quite easily if you know the speed of light and you uh, agree with me that 1 foot is approximately 30 second 30 centimeter all right. So, how much time does it take for light to travel 1 micron? Can we work that out or maybe 3 micron? How much time does it take for light to travel 3 micron? Light requires 1 nanosecond 10 to the power minus 9 seconds to travel 30 centimeter. So, to travel 3 micron how much time is required? 1 frame to second is that right or 10 frame to second? We have two answers. Remember, 1 centimeter is 10 to the power minus 2, 10 frame per second, not 1 frame per second, right. So, if I can give a path difference of 1 micron, then that is equivalent to 10 frame per second. Is it easy or is it difficult to mechanically produce a path length of 1 micron? So, when I say giving a mechanically giving a path difference of 1 micron what I mean is that the light will come and strike a mirror let us say then I will move the mirror forward by half a micron. Then the path difference that will come of the light that is being retro reflected let us have two mirrors actually one mirror like this one mirror like this light comes hits this mirror comes here goes back. I move this assembly of mirrors by half a micron that is equivalent to uh, 10 nano 10 uh, frame to second time delay right and then the way we always give time delay is that we we are going to see it in the lab we mount this whole thing on a screw so we have to just turn the screw very minutely so that the linear displacement is uh, less than micron that is very easily done actually so it is not very difficult to achieve frame to second time resolution by giving path differences of a micron or a less. We are going to come back to this when we discuss maybe frame per second optical gating. But the technique that we have discussed in a very preliminary manner here is called frame per second pump probe technique. And most of the ultrafast studies are based on some variant of this technique or the other. Right. If you come back to this, this is the data that I showed you earlier, snapshots of bond breaking here also what Zewell's group had done was that they used the pump and they used the probe, but then they did something more. They used uh, very short pulses, so they could do what is called a, uh, they could excite a wave packet and they could look at wave packet dynamics. That is why they could see oscillations like this. We will come back to wave packet dynamics when we are a little further into the course. But before that, let us ask a simpler question. We are saying that we are going to create an excited state population, fine. 
but we create an excited state population and then the molecule comes back to the ground state uh, that is not much of a fun. At most we measure the excited state population, but then what will we do with that number? The question that we want to ask is can we initiate some chemistry, some chemical reaction by using these pulses of light and the answer is yes. How would you do it? Suppose I have some photochemical reaction by which I excite a molecule and the molecule gives out protons. This phenomenon is called photoacidity that is what we are going to discuss now. Now, suppose we take that molecule a photoacid which gives out protons when excited by light and at this time we excite it with pulse light. What will happen? We will get a burst of photons coming out of the molecule when the light pulse hits it. So, within the pulse width let us say we have a 100 femtosecond pulse within those 100 femtosecond we would have created a uh, certain concentration of proton in the vicinity of the uh, laser uh, the uh, light spot that is incident on the sample ok. So, we can create bursts of photon uh, protons this way and then suppose we have some acid catalyzed reaction. We can initiate that acid catalyzed reaction with the with femtosecond time accuracy if we uh, release the protons by using a femtosecond pulse right. The question is why is it that protons will be released in the first place? as a result of irradiation with light. To understand that let us go back to some fundamental photochemistry and let us recall that reactivity and excited state is actually not the same as that in the ground state. Why is that so? Before we go to that let me ask a very simple question. In chemistry what is it that determines reactivity? What is it that determines how a molecule will react and easy. Uh, well, bond strength yes, but something more fundamental electron configuration is not it ok. Forget molecules go back to atoms what is it that determines that sodium is going to give up an electron and become sodium plus what is it that determines that chlorine likes to take up an electron and become uh, chloride. It is uh, electron configuration right. In chemistry we know that electron configuration determines reactivity. And what we now need to uh, appreciate is that electron configuration is different between ground state and excited state that is actually obvious, but sometimes uh, even the obvious has to be restated. So, let us look at this simple diagram here electronic arrangement is different in the excited state than in the ground state right. So, let us see what is electronic arrangement in the ground state in a very simple organic molecule no unpaired electron no nothing we can draw it like this simply. This is a more complicated picture, but for now we can live with this right. We have uh, a doubly occupied homo highest occupied molecular orbital and of course, an empty lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. Now, let us say we perform a homo to lumo excitation ok. So, in this case before the excitation in the ground state this ground state is called uh, uh, singlet ground state S0. Uh, what is the electron configuration? If I denote homo by small h and lumo by small l, h to l0. Now, let us say I performed a homo to lumo excitation. Now, what is the configuration? H1 l1. So, configuration is different. If configuration is different, reactivity can be different. I am not saying that it has to be different, but it can be different. That is first point to take home. Second point is that this is not the only way in which uh, your uh, excited state can be formed. It is not necessary that your excited state is going to be a singlet. It can be a triplet also and once again triplet excited state actually has a little more profound meaning, but for now we can live with this ok. And triplet state as I think we know has uh, T 1 has a lower energy than S 1 ok. We will not discuss why uh, we have discussed this in a little more detail in our uh, molecular spectroscopy course right. So, the point is that electronic arrangement is different in the excited state than in the ground state. So, reactivity might be different ok that is a general discussion. Now, let us go to a little more specific discussion. Let us talk about the problem that we introduced a little while ago 
photoacidity. It is a general rule that organic acids, I have written acids here, so I do not mean sulfuric acid, nitric acid, perchloric acid, I mean organic acids. Organic acids are more acidic in excited state, organic bases are more basic. To explain this, let me once again ask a question, the answer to which is known to everyone. Let us take an example of an organic acid. The first example that comes to my mind, of course, first example that comes to your mind could be uh, carboxylic acid, but let us talk about phenol. Phenol is acidic, strongly acidic or weakly acidic, it is a weak acid, right. We will shortly discuss what the pKa is for at least one phenol. Why is phenol acidic? H plus, H plus release. Phenoxide ion that is formed by release of H plus is stabilized. How is it stabilized? I do not want to use resonance because resonance is a valence bond, I mean resonance is a tool by which you extend valence bond theory to more than beyond two center two electron system and the problem is yes and the problem is that it does not allow me to access excited state. So, let us talk about molecular orbitals ok. Delocalization is something we can live with. Now, let us think a little bit, we have phenol, we have the proton has gone out, so we have the phenoxide ion. So, let us not think in terms of those electron uh, pairs or anything, let us think in terms of an electron cloud on oxygen ok. An electron cloud on oxygen is not a happy situation, it, if it can get delocalized it is better. So, now if it has to get delocalized in the same molecule, it has to be accommodated in some molecular orbital. What is the molecular orbital that is available? The unoccupied antibonding orbitals ok. If you go back to the simplest example of well phenol phenol a benzene ring and OH, then uh, I think we remember the uh, energy level diagram for benzene right, 3 bonding MOs, 3 antibonding MOs. So, one of those two degenerate antibonding MOs is the lowest energy molecular orbital available to accommodate the incoming electron cloud from oxygen ok and that is what happens that is why phenol is acidic. Now, think we have performed a pi pi star excitation, homo to lumo excitation. Now, what will happen? Now, you create a vacancy in the lower energy bonding orbital right and now the incoming electron cloud from oxygen can happily reside in the lower energy bonding molecular orbital, it does not have to go to the higher energy antibonding orbital that is why it is a happier situation ok and that is why phenol is more acidic in the excited state than in the ground state ok. And uh, you can build a similar argument for uh, things like aromatic carboxylates which are bases, they also become stronger bases for similar reason. Uh, this is discussed in any standard photochemistry textbook ok. Now, I have proposed something. But there is no reason for you to believe what I am saying unless I show you some uh, experimental proof. And here we are showing you an experimental proof. This discussion is available in Lakovich's Principles uh, of Fluorescent Spectroscopy book. What I am showing you here is absorption spectra of beta naphthol at different uh, acidities, ok. So, first one is this black line denotes absorption spectrum of beta naphthol in 0 0.1 molar HCl, very strongly acidic. So, we can safely say that this absorption spectrum, oh, that was a little bit of a giveaway, uh, this absorption spectrum at high acid concentration is that of undissociated beta naphthol, yeah, beta naphthol no naphtholate is there. Now, look at uh, the spectrum that is in dashed lines. That is for beta naphthol in presence of 0 0.05 molar sodium hydroxide and it is distinctly different from the absorption spectrum that we have for your uh, high highly acidic solution. Why is that so? What is the species of beta naphthol that is going to be there in an alkaline medium like 0 0.05 molar sodium hydroxide? beta naphtholate, proton is not there ok. So, now we know our alphabet.
this is the absorption spectrum of naphthol, this here the red shifted one is the absorption spectrum of naphtholate. Now, look at the situation at pH 3, can you even see the absorption spectrum of beta naphthol at pH 3 in this diagram? If you look very carefully in this region, you see some dots right, you do not see it because it is so nicely overlapped with the absorption spectrum of beta naphthol in highly acidic solutions. What does that mean? That means, at pH 3 there is no naphtholate, it is beta naphthol all the way right. Now, let us look at the fluorescence spectrum, emission spectrum. This here is the emission spectrum of beta naphthol at pH at uh, highly acidic concentration. So, we can safely say that this spectrum is for undissociated beta naphthol. This spectrum here is for naphtholate because it is in highly alkaline solution. Now, at pH 3 you see the spectrum that we get the emission spectrum is not exactly what we get in the highly acidic solution, rather you get a shoulder that more or less matches what the emission spectrum would have been in highly alkaline condition. What does that mean? The absorption spectra tell us that at pH 3 beta naphthol is completely undissociated. Emission spectra tell us that in emission we get signature of some naphtholate at pH 3, but in ground state there is no naphtholate. Where did this uh, naphtholate come from that is emitting? It must have come as a result of excited state dissociation or photo dissociation of beta naphthol all right. So, it seems that photo acidity is real. At pH 3 even though there is no beta naphthol at ground state everything is all molecules are in naphthol form, some of them actually lose proton in the excited state to give you beta naphthol signature of which is obtained in the emission spectrum ok. So, photo acidity is qualitatively demonstrated. Now, let us see it in a little more quantitative manner. So, using absorption spectrum you can construct a titration curve, inflection point of that curve is going to give you the uh, uh, pKa in the ground state. If I do a similar exercise using emission spectrum again I will get a pKa, will that pKa be of the ground state? No, it will be of the excited state. So, let us see what these titration curves look like, these are the two titration curves. For the ground state you see pKa turns out to be 9.2 as you said correctly it is a very weak acid, in the excited state pK turns out to be 2 and remember pK is log of hydrogen ion concentration or the hydrogen ion activity. So, when we go from 9.2 to 9, 9.2 to 2 we are saying the change in concentration of protons is from 10 to the power minus 9 to 10 to the power minus 2, 7 orders of magnitude change. So, photoacidity is actually a uh, is not something that is uh, very trivial it is a strong effect ok. So, now if I take the same beta naphthol and uh, I excite it using pulse light, what will happen? The moment the pulse light is incident on the beta naphthol solution, we will get a burst of protons coming out. Now, if there is if I want to follow the kinetics of any proton mediated process, proton catalyzed process, acid catalyzed process, then I can do that right. First of all I can even work out the uh, time it takes if I can for the beta naphthol to form naphtholate to form from beta naphthol post excitation. All I have to do is I have to do a pump probe experiment using probe uh, in this region all right. We are going to talk a little uh, more later on about pump probe spectroscopy about the different kinds of signal today is only an introduction. So, we could actually follow the dissociation of this, but more interestingly we can also follow the kinetics of processes that are uh, triggered by this burst of protons that we have released. In fact, this kind of an experiment has been done uh, in 2003 the first paper was published in science. What you see here pyranine this is a very strong photo acid when you excite it proton comes out and a base that was used is acetate using a UV pump 
proton was liberated from pyranine and using an IR probe, I think we all know what IR spectroscopy is used for. IR spectroscopy is used to uh, identify functional groups in a molecule, right. So, uh, in this example when proton goes out what will happen? This OH stretch is going to go down with time and then here uh, this acetate OH this will come up with time. So, that is the experiment that is done and once again we will come back and discuss this experiment in more detail later on, but uh, in a nutshell this is what the kind of uh, data you get. You see a rise in absorbance which is uh, which signifies protonation of acetate and uh, with a little more uh, closer analysis of the data what was done by the group of neighboring and co-workers is that they could work out the mechanism of reaction between an acid and a base. All of us have studied in school that acid base reaction is very fast and you cannot define the mechanism that is not true any longer. I mean it has not been true for 12, 13 years now, 14 years because the mechanism of acid base reaction has been worked out using ultra fast UV pump or visible pump IR probe experiments. So, that is uh, the kind of information you can get from ultra fast pump probe experiments, ok. So, uh, this is our introduction to how to follow ultra fast processes. Next we are going to move on to uh, see how you follow uh, dynamics of fluorescence in hundreds of picoseconds to hundreds of nanoseconds using a technique called time correlated single photon counting.